In our 2020 vision segment, the countdown is on until the first votes are cast. That would be Iowa with the caucuses there now just 105 days away. And a new poll shows a tightening at the top of the field with Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren running a virtual tie in Iowa. Pete Buttigieg just a few points behind and leapfrogging over Bernie Sanders, but nobody has even 20% support in Iowa. Overall nationally, Real Clear Politics Average shows the former vice president leading the pack by six points. Warren second, Sanders third, with Buttigieg and Kamala Harris rounding out the top five. Here to discuss all things 2020, Paul Steinhauser. Paul is a national political reporter based in New Hampshire. He's also the former political editor at CNN. Paul, let's start with those new numbers from Iowa. Pete Buttigieg is up over Bernie Sanders into third place and into double digits, but he's not moving much in the national polls. Is this a big deal or just some regional support for a fellow Midwesterner? Yeah, listen, he's put a lot of investment into Iowa. A lot of time there on the ground, spent a lot of money to build up a strong staff in the state, and it seems to be paying off that as well as this strong debate performance he had last week in Ohio. It all seems to be paying off for Buttigieg there in the first caucus state. He's also got pretty good numbers in the most recent polls here in New Hampshire. You've got Sanders, Biden and Warren at the top, but right after that, right around double digits, right around 10% is Buttigieg. So, you know, he hasn't been making huge waves, but all this hard work he's been doing on the campaign trail and building up support and staff in the early voting states, it seems to be paying off at, the, at an opportune time. And you know, Paul, we often tend to look at campaigns at the moment that we're in right now, but the dynamics always change. So just remind viewers, the impact that Iowa can and usually does have in terms of momentum and shaping the way the primaries that follow are contested. Yeah, huge impact. Listen, Iowa and New Hampshire, the first two states to vote, are going to winnow the field. That's their job. We've got 18 candidates right now. We may have a little less than that by the time we get to the first votes in Iowa, which is just three and a half months away. But for candidates who don't perform well in Iowa, maybe a top five finish, they're going to be gone. They're not even going to make it to New Hampshire, and New Hampshire will only magnify that. So by the time we get to the end of February and on to early March in those Super Tuesday states when more than 15 vote, including some big, big states, it's going to be a much, much smaller field. Biggest single headline from the weekend in the Democratic primary was probably Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and most of her squad endorsing Bernie Sanders at a big rally in Queens. When it was announced, Paul, I argued that endorsement probably wouldn't move the needle that much. AOC is a Sanders acolyte. It was never a question of if, but when. And then I saw the crowd, and that could really impact enthusiasm. Do you think it will impact enthusiasm for Sanders, and is there more to this endorsement than I'm missing? Is it a bigger deal than I gave it credit for? It's a big deal, right? Endorsements arguably don't make that much of a difference. This one may have. First of all, that crowd, let's talk about that, Andrew. 25,000 people, that tops the largest crowds we've seen to date for either A, Elizabeth Warren or B, Kamala Harris when she first jumped into the race way back in January. Enormous crowd. And also, right now, let's be honest, there is a big, brutal battle going on between Sanders and Warren. They're good friends. They're both progressive. Uh, they're both populists. And they're battling for that progressive wing of the party. This helps Bernie Sanders at a time he needed it really needed it because, of course, Warren has overshadowed him and overtaken him in the polls. And, of course, he had that heart attack scare just a couple weeks ago. He had a strong debate performance. He showed his health was okay. And right after that, he gets this big endorsement, a nice one-two punch for Bernie Sanders when he really needed it. We'll point out that Sanders uh, got a larger crowd for an event in the Bronx back in 2016 and just absolutely got drubbed in the New York primary that followed shortly thereafter. You mentioned Elizabeth Warren or Perhaps we should refer to her as frontrunner Elizabeth Warren. She now says she'll release her funding plan for her biggest policies, including how to pay for Medicare for all. And you know she's been taking a lot of heat for not being more specific. This looks like a bit of a concession to her critics. Do you think it is? And is she making a mistake by doing this? We know that the funding is going to increase taxes, which will then be used to hammer her. She's been focused on costs to individuals, which you could argue makes more sense as a way to view her proposal. She really didn't have a choice, did she? You saw what happened in that debate last week in front of, what, almost 10 million viewers. She was hammered by a bunch of her rivals, not just one or two, over not answering the question. A question that Bernie Sanders had answered just a minute before, right? The middle class taxes, yes, they would go up, but that would be, you know, uh, that would be, uh, it, it, there would also see reductions, of course, in, in payments, co-payments and premiums and everything else. She would not answer that question. This was only going to intensify, right? The next debate, and even before that, you're going to hear more and more calls. She has to put this to rest whether she wants to or not, and that is why I think she conceded and is now going to have some kind of announcement on how she'll pay for her Medicare for All plan. 
Got a question, Paul, for all those mainstream or so-called moderate Democrats. For as many Democrats who want a more progressive nominee, we're hearing more and more griping from those who want a viable moderate candidate. Joe Biden is that candidate, but he's not generating a host of enthusiasm. His lead is gone in some of the polls. Amy Klobuchar is just starting to gain a little momentum, hardly catching fire. Buttigieg, I'm not sure if he's trying to position himself in that centrist lane or not. And we, of course, get those rumors from Michael Bloomberg. It almost seems like a movement in need of a standard bearer, sort of like the never Trump movement we got from the Republicans in 2016. To your mind, is that a scenario that's worked in the past? Does the candidate produce the movement or does the movement produce the candidate? Now, it happens in both ways and shapes and forms. So right now, Joe Biden is hoping and still believes he is that candidate. And, you know, when we get to that larger electorate that we'll see in February when voters actually get to vote, that may be the case. Nobody's writing Joe Biden off yet. He's slipped a little bit, yes, of course, and he's now a co-front runner along with Elizabeth Warren, but uh, he is still at the top of that lane, if, if, if that's what you want to call it. But give credit to Pete Buttigieg, give credit to Amy Klobuchar. They had strong performances. Klobuchar came right here to New Hampshire after last week's debate. She saw that the, her crowds were a little bit larger, a little more, more enthusiastic. Of course, her and Buttigieg each raised a, a million dollars in that 24 hours after the debate. I'll add one more name to that lane. And that would be Cory Booker, the senator from New Jersey. He's very popular up here in New Hampshire. He was back up here today. I had a chance to chat with him. He feels pretty optimistic as well. Uh, stay, stay tuned on this one, though. I'm not writing Biden off yet as the still front runner, at least, for the center left lane of the party. Booker is from New Jersey. Of course, I think most people around here have forgotten that he's even running. Wanted to ask you about this uh, also. Tulsi Gabbard, who got into it with Hillary Clinton online over the weekend, a meme surfaced about labeling Gabbard a, a figurehead for Russia as she might run as a third party candidate a la Jill Stein and steal votes from the Democratic nominee. It got people talking about Gabbard and the possible third party impact. Also got people talking about Hillary Clinton again as Gabbard challenged Clinton to enter the race and debate her. The whole discussion felt like a bit of a waste of time to me. I'm wondering what your reaction was. It, it was, uh, yes, I, I agree with you. To a degree, it was a waste of time. It was also an early Christmas gift for Tulsi Gabbard because she's down there at one, two, three percent. Not a lot of people are talking about her. Now people are talking about her. She was one of the top stories on the campaign trail this weekend. So for whatever her reasons and motives were, Hillary Clinton gave Tulsi Gabbard a big Christmas gift. Gabbard, though, did campaigning in Iowa this weekend. Uh, she made it very clear she would not be running as a third party candidate. So the Russians may want that. Moscow would love that. She says it's not going to happen. And, and the concern from Democratic uh, members of the establishment about a possible Democratic-leaning independent or third-party run, that's a legitimate concern, though, because of the impact that Jill Stein had, correct? Oh, exactly, and that's why you saw Hillary Clinton criticize Jill Stein in, in her, uh, her podcast. Uh, there is concern about that. Remember, there were some other independents earlier in the cycle that thought about running and never did, uh, including the Starbucks, the former Starbucks CEO. But uh, as of now, that concern seems to be allayed. And again, Gabbard saying, at least for now, that she has no intention of running as a third party candidate if she doesn't win the nomination, which, of course, is a very long shot. Finally, Paul, I'm going to come back to Joe Biden. The race has certainly tightened. He and Warren are closer in the polls. Some of his numbers have dipped in others. They have not. But it doesn't seem like there's a lot of enthusiasm behind Biden. And he's not gaining ground through this Ukraine thing, which you know, given Trump's focus on him, would seem to bolster his claim that he's the one that Trump fears because he's the one who can beat Biden. I, I feel like Biden should be making hay out of this, and he's not. Am I misreading that? Is Biden in, in as much trouble as I suspect he might be in? What's your sense on the ground in New Hampshire about the state of Joe Biden's candidacy? You make a good point. Listen, this was Biden's moment to really frame this as a two-person race, him versus Donald Trump. And, and he... Uh, did not do that in the debate the other night. I thought he had a pretty lackluster answer last week. Here on the ground in New Hampshire, listen, Biden supporters are, are still with him. Nobody's fretting. He still has a very strong campaign here. Uh, but again, you raise some good points as to whether this whole controversy, this whole crisis and the impeachment process as, as well, maybe hurts Joe Biden more than it helps him. All right. Paul Steinhauser is a political reporter based in New Hampshire, former political editor at CNN, and apparently on the hunt for maple syrup out in the wilderness of New Hampshire today. Paul, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hey, appreciate it. And up next, we pivot to sports. Two teams from our area square off on Monday Night Football. First place Patriots visit the struggling Jets. Will we see an upset? 
Well, the Pats continuing to dominate. We'll take you to MetLife Stadium for a preview next.